Hello friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor. We want to welcome you to a special edition of Amazing Facts Friday Night Live. Uh, we don't do this very often, Pastor Ross, but sometimes when there's something special on the horizon, we actually want to go live to our friends. We know that we've got a, a large viewing audience on Friday nights, and so uh, we're directing this message uh, specially into your homes. Right now at the beginning of the program, we want to get two things out there. We're going to be taking Bible questions. And so if you have a Bible question, we're going to have a QR code that's going to go up on the screen. And you can take your phone. I think most of you know how to do this. Take a picture of that. We'll leave it up there for a moment. And uh, then also call or text your friends after you get the QR code for your questions. Let them know Amazing Facts is live. We're going to be talking about something very exciting that's on the horizon, as well as taking your Bible questions. Uh, Pastor Ross, we're having a typhoon here <laughs> in California right now. We're thankful that we haven't lost power. If you go to your news, you'll see that Interstate 80 is closed. They're having like the snowstorm of the century <laughs> in the mountains around here. And so we're glad that everything's working and uh, we're glad you're tuning in. Uh, before we begin, it's always good to start with prayer. So Pastor Ross, you have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, what a joy to be able to just take a few moments and open your word and study together. And Lord, we're so excited about the opportunity to share the gospel with others around the world, especially now at this time of verse history. Mm -hmm. So Father, we ask your blessing on our little talk this evening, our program, be with those who are watching and listening. And we pray that your spirit to move upon every heart, Lord, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, friends may have noticed that behind us we've got a sign that says, City of Critical Mass. And you might be wondering, what is that all about? Well, that City of Critical Mass is New York City. And one of the main things we want to do during our broadcast tonight is we're going to tell you about something that affects everybody that is watching right now in one of several ways. It's a program that is coming to New York City. It'll be the 25th anniversary of the Net 99 Millennium of Prophecy program. Matter of fact, we're going to be in the same building and just the way the Lord worked it all out. And uh, it's going to be a global broadcast of an evangelistic program called Prophecy Odyssey. And you can see the uh, advertising, uh, some of the handbill artwork that's going to be up there on your screen. The dates for the program is going to be September 20 to October 5, live from New York City translated into six of the major languages of the world, an evangelistic event. I think it's probably going to be the premier evangelistic event that's going to be available around the world through AFTV, 3ABN is carrying the program, Hope Channel International is carrying the program, and of course anybody around the world that gets the internet can participate. Here's the two principal ways, maybe three, that you can participate. One is you can open your home, invite your friends in, and there'll be lessons you can download from the Prophecy Odyssey website. And do a Bible study and bring your friends to the Lord. Let them come to the meetings and during these one hour presentations, I guess the whole program is about 90 minutes. The actual sermon part will be roughly 60 minutes. And you know, Pastor, Bible I'm questions. very excited about this. It's going to be a great program. As you mentioned, we've got about 90 minutes. There'll be great music. Mm -hmm. We'll take time for questions from the audience. Those who are watching, they'll be able to send in their questions. What I like about it is, as you mentioned, it's 25 years after Net 99. And yes, it was very powerful. In Net 99, we used satellite and we broadcast around mm -hmm. the world. But we can reach even more people through the Internet. In Net 99, the Internet still consisted of dial-up. It was very slow. You couldn't broadcast, you know, a whole evangelistic series by any means. And we had big analog satellite dishes and we pointed at the right satellite. But here people are able to participate with their phone wherever they are. Yeah. So this is a great opportunity to tell your friends about it, your neighbors. You can even host it in your home, which mm -hmm. is kind of exciting. For those who are watching, you might not be able to come to New York, but you can still host the program either in your church or in your home. There's a number of options. We actually have a website, prophecyodyssey.com. And if you want to learn more about that, we encourage you to take a look at it. Just Prophecy Odyssey. Dot com. It's got all of the information. We're still updating things on the mm -hmm. website, but there's enough to start planning, putting the calendar. It's going to be an exciting event, and of course, we want to get the word out far and wide. Amen. And so one way, of course, is open up your home or your church, invite your friends over, say, uh, fasten your seatbelt. We're going to have a Bible study 
because we only have 15 presentations, maybe 16 if we do the first Sabbath morning, and we're going to get right into some of the very relevant things in prophecy. And then the other way, I said there's a couple of ways, we're doing something different this time. We're inviting people to be Manhattan missionaries where they can actually come and help. You know, people often think, oh, I wish I could maybe sometime in my life go be a missionary and go to the jungle somewhere and win souls for Jesus. Well, friends, you can be a missionary. We're inviting you to come to the concrete jungle of New York City, and you can either come for one or two days, you can come for the entire event. We're working with officials in the city to try and get some reduced rates on hotel rooms because it's a very expensive city. And you can be a Manhattan missionary. Again, there's a QR code up there on the screen. If you click that, it's going to take you to the website where you can get the information. Now, here's what we're doing, Pastor Ross. We own the building where we're doing the meetings. It seats 2,000 people for the broadcast. We've got it 24 hours a day for almost three weeks. During the day, we're going to do free AFCO evangelism training in the mornings. We'll give them literature. We're going to let the groups go out with some instruction on the streets in New York City, a beautiful time of year then, typically in September or October. Hand out literature, do some street ministry. There might be some groups doing some basic medical things, blood pressure, so forth. Some singing groups on the street. Some are going to be doing street preaching. Some of the pastors in greater New York said, we do street preaching. They get a license to do that. And we're going to go to the city of critical mass. Mm. You know, there's Amazing. a lot. New York City. It's a great opportunity for folks. As you mentioned, a number of things to be planning. Uh, not only is it the training, we're going to do some extra AFCO personal evangelism mm -hmm. training. They're going to be sharing, be involved in the city, but they're also, of course, going to be involved in the meetings. So we're going to need some volunteers to help us with things like greeting, ushering, bringing people to their seats. We have something called row hosts, and that's mm -hmm. where we have some volunteers who befriend the people sitting around them and they partner with us. So if there's anyone out there and you want to kind of take a few days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe just a weekend, and you want to be a part of this very special event, go to the website, prophecyodyssey.com, and uh, you can actually click on there. It says Manhattan Missionary, and you can learn more about that just by going to the website. Come be a part of this exciting event. Yeah, and you'll be in one of the most interesting cities in the world. The reason we call it the City of Critical Mass is if you were to say, what city is visibly known around the world? And that's one reason we've chosen New York City is, uh, you name it, it's in New York City. It's got the United Nations there. It's got Madison Avenue there. Uh, it's probably, it's not only one of the most populated cities in the world, but you know, if people have been watching any movies in the last 30 years, it's been rampaged by King Kong, Godzilla, destroyed by aliens, asteroids, tsunamis. So many television programs and movies have focused on New York City. Not only it's, like I said, a financial capital of the world, uh, people know about it. And right now they're having some crises in the city because it's becoming, once again, as it was in the days of the Statue of Liberty, an entry port for immigrants from around the world that are coming in. And of course, not only is there a great opportunity for evangelism and soul winning New York City, but you know, you can bring the whole family. And if you've never seen the Statue of Liberty, or mm -hmm. if you've never been to Ground Zero, or some of the great museums in New York City, people can take a few days. There's going to be an opportunity during the meetings. You're not going to be busy the whole time. So if you want to take some day trips and go take the ferry to the Statue of Liberty or go to some of the museums, that you can make a whole family vacation out of it. So yep. something else to keep in mind. Absolutely. Now, just so everyone understands, you can come and join the Prophecy Odyssey, be with Amazing Facts and 3ABN for this mission project in New York City, working alongside with the Greater New York Conference and the General Conference. It's going to be epic. We've got several departments that are working on this with us. And, uh, but training's free. The literature we give you will be free. You've got to pay your travel and your lodging mm -hmm. while you're there. But, uh, you know, we're going to Panama next month. And we had to cap it. Once we said we're going, people are paying their own way. What, we got like 200 people going to do mission, 240, going to do mission work. People want to do mission work, mm -hmm. friends. This is going to be a historic opportunity. So pray for it and think about the Prophecy Odyssey program. Now, 
while I'm talking, let me know if any questions come in, and we'll jump in. Yeah, let's put that let's put that QR code up to our team at the back there. If you have a question, we're going to take some time. The bulk of our program is actually going to be answering your Bible questions. Scan the QR code that you see on your screen right now. Maybe we can leave that up for a little while so folks will have a time to get their phone and scan. You can type your question in. I'm going to be able to see it here on my phone, and Pastor Doug will try and answer mm -hmm. as many of those questions that come in. Uh, before we go to the questions, though, I just want to mention one thing. Sometimes people wonder, well, you know, Pastor Doug, we, we believe in evangelism and so on and soul winning, but public evangelism, the preaching of the Word in a, in a public forum, is that still effective? Do people still respond to the preaching of the Word? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we know they do because we do evangelism and doing meetings all the time. But there is a statement that our friends might be interested in hearing. This is actually from Testimonies, Volume 5, and this is what it says. It says there may be conversions without the instrumentality of a sermon, where persons are so situated that they are deprived of every means of grace. They are wrought upon by the Spirit of God and convinced of the truth through the reading of the Word. But God's appointed means of saving souls is the foolishness of preaching. Mm -hmm. There is power in the preaching of the Word. We believe that. Amen. And so the central focus of the whole evangelistic series, of course, is the proclamation of the three angels' message the everlasting gospel going with a loud voice, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, preaching God's last warning message. Yeah. And, and some people might think, well, you know, New York City is so busy, it's so high tech. How are you still going to reach people with just preaching there? Well, you know, there's never really been an improvement on the proclamation of the word that is anointed by the Holy Spirit. You know, we've got a number of quotes that I'm, we're going to put some of them up on the screen for you. I want folks to see some of the interesting facts about New York and why we're going there. Uh, first of all, New York has got 8.8 .8 million people. There's a quote from uh, the book of, or I should say, Seven Testimonies, page 54. As I've considered the situation in New York, a great burden has come upon my soul. In the night season, matters have been presented to me in this light. New York will be worked. Openings will be found in parts of the city in which there are no churches. So part of what we're doing, Pastor Ross, is we're going to try and plant two churches in New York City in connection with the Prophecy Odyssey mm. program. In the uh, Atlantic Union Gleaner, it says, it is a great missionary field. It's going to require a much larger outlay of means that is now anticipated. It is difficult. It's expensive working in New York City. Uh, you and I were there, what, uh, it's a couple months ago now in preparation for these meetings and just takes your breath away what it costs. But you know, we believe if God is calling us to do this, that's what happened in Net 99. We mm -hmm. said, New York City is so expensive. But the Lord blessed that series. We still meet people every month that says that they came to the Lord in connection with that series. In fact, uh, I was in Tennessee last week and preaching in a church. A lady came up to me after the service. She said, I want you to know that uh, I came to the Lord from the Net 99 meeting in New York City and then my husband and my children that now have children of their own. And she said, you look around the lobby here, she says there are three generations because of that event. Mm. So friends, there will be a harvest if we preach the word. It's uh, the media capital, financial capital, advertising capital of the world, home to the United Nations, internationally recognized. Uh, people uh, need to also remember the whole world saw what happened during 9-11. Those images are kind of printed and broadcast around the world. So people are acquainted with this. And so this is going to be 15 meetings that will cover the three angels' messages translated into the major languages of the world. We're going to have hundreds of Manhattan missionaries that are going to join us for this series. On-site street preaching, literature evangelism, people can give out handbills, training that will be free. New lessons we're using that people will be able to download from the website around the world, translate. And so we're doing everything we can. We think Jesus is coming soon. And so we want to get the word out as much as we can. Now you'll see a picture up on the screen. I think we've actually got a picture of the hall that has been reserved. And uh, there it is. That's the Manhattan Center. It's called the Hammerstein Ballroom, right down by Madison Square Garden, Penn Station, there's two subway outlets that go there so people can get to the location. And I'll tell you, it's very exciting to be in the Big Apple that time of year. And um, 
I think folks have probably heard an election, a presidential election is going to be coming up. This is going to be a month just before the election. So the world's going to kind of be in overdrive. What a time to be alive and be preaching the gospel. You know, you step out of the front door of the Manhattan Center, you look to the left down the street, and there's the Empire State Building. So it is sort of midtown, right in the heart of Manhattan, and busy people coming and going, and people from all different backgrounds, different religions, different, mm -hmm. different countries. I mean, you hear so many different languages that's there representing people from around the world. It's sort of the melting pot, it is, of, of people wanting, traveling, looking for purpose, meaning, mm -hmm. looking for a better life. It's, it's all focused there in New York City. You know, I, j I was looking at amazing facts. We like amazing facts here. And uh, not only are there 8 million people, there are more than 800 languages spoken in New York City, making it linguistically the most diverse city in the world. And one reason we're cho we've chosen New York City is when we broadcast an international program, if the audience looks a little too much like one demographic or another, then some people tune out. New York City is a melting pot. The, there's going to be people there from all different parts of the planet, and that's exactly what we want. So everybody will be able to relate. And we expect we're going to have some of the same personalities that were there when we did the program in 1999. Mm -hmm. So plan on tuning in to the Prophecy Odyssey. Once again, put it on your calendar. That's going to be uh, September 20 to October 5. Any questions? Yes, we have got some questions, and maybe we'll put that QR code up. Thank you for all the questions coming in. Pastor Doug, we'll start with the first one at the top. It says, in Revelation chapter 11, is it possible that the water turning to blood actually is the witnessing of people turning people to Christ's testimony? If water represents people, water turning to blood, could it have a symbolic meaning. And they said Revelation 11? Uh, yes, I think they mean Revelation 16. Yeah. I was talking about the plagues. Yeah, well, the, the seven plagues, it's saying basically that God is going to curse the oceans and then the fresh water supply. And the angel says, true and righteous are you, Lord. You're giving them, they've slain mm -hmm. the saints and shed the blood of saints. You're giving them blood to drink. So I don't think the blood there represents uh, the people. It's a fulfillment of what Joel said of signs of the last days. He specifically says, and there's going to be the sun will turn to darkness, the moon to, to uh, and he said there'll be blood and smoke. And in the plagues, he's describing the, the terrible uh, suffering in the last days. And of course, the plagues that came upon Egypt were very literal. Yeah. The river Nile did turn to blood or a blood-like substance. We believe the same thing is going to happen during the plagues. However, having said that, there is going to be a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit just prior to the close mm -hmm. of probation, this is before the plagues fall, where the gospel of God, Revelation chapter 18, the earth is illuminated with the glory of God, a manifestation of His character. And we want to make sure that we're ready for that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that we can proclaim the loud voice. Yeah, God's we're hoping this message. meeting is part That's of right, that. That's right, part of that great proclamation. All right, another question that we have here. It says, uh, Hi, Pastor Doug. What will happen to the newborn believers once the gates are closed before Jesus returns will they still be able to be risen by the Lord? So I am wondering here, the gates, are they referring to the New Jerusalem? Yeah, there's no, no uh, born-again believers that are going to be shut out. Mm -hmm. Everybody born again says you have everlasting life. They'll, right. The Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in to the joy of the Lord. So they're not shut out. So I hope I'm answering what they're asking. If, if we're not, go ahead and send that question again. Yeah, as you can tell, this is live. So this is the first time we're looking <laughs> at the questions as they're coming in. Well, Pastor Doug, here's an interesting question. Uh, how do you know the difference between acting in faith versus being presumptuous? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, you know, for one thing, we have a little book that's called Determining the Will of God. And so there's some, there's some tests that we apply when making decisions. First of all, you want to be guided by the Word of God in that decision guided by the Spirit, guided by providence, guided by Christian counsel. Um, the Bible says in the multitude of counselor, and that would be godly counselors, their safety. Um, sometimes when you reach an impasse and you have to make a decision, you say, Lord, I see two good alternatives. I'm not sure which one to do, but I have to make a decision. And you have to take a step and say, Lord, block or close that door if it's not your will. If you don't have to make the decision yet and you're concerned I might be presumptuous, continue to pray and don't jump over the river sooner than you have to. Mm -hmm. So sometimes 
do what you're doing with all your might and wait on the Lord. And you mentioned that book. It's called Determining the Will of God. Yeah. How to Determine the Will of God. And you can download God. that for free. Yep, just the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.com or .org. Pastor Doug, will we still be married and have our kids in heaven? Well, we'll still have families. In other words, you're, you're still going to have loved ones that you'll rejoice with. Um, Jesus seems to indicate that there will be no new marriages in heaven. He said we'll be like the angels, which neither marry nor are given in marriage. The earth is going to be populated. He told Adam and Eve, fill the earth. Well, the earth is going to be filled with the redeemed. Does that mean that, um, you know, when you and Ruth get to heaven, does God give you divorce papers? <laughs> no. Well, not necessarily. You'll get to spend eternity with your best right. friend. I don't think God's going to divorce Adam and Eve when they get to heaven. And so, um, yeah, we'll still have our loved ones and our friends and our family and those tight relationships, but it's going to be a little different than it is here. No one will be disappointed, I promise. Just get there. That's right. All right, very good. Another question we have, is Jesus the Savior of the world? And what does that phrase mean? Is Jesus the Savior of the world? Well, Jesus is the only Savior in the world. It's not Muhammad. It's not Buddha. And the only one who died with uh, the potency to cover the sins of everybody in the world is Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. So Christ, uh, through his sacrifice and the Father, provided a way where anyone in the world that hears the gospel and responds can be saved. Mm -hmm. In that sense, he is the Savior of the world. Okay, absolutely. All right, here's a good question. Romans chapter 5, verse 18, it says, so also through one act of righteousness, the result was justification of life for all mankind. The question is, what is this referring to? Through one act of righteousness, the result was justification of all mankind. Yes. Uh, Paul is making a comparison here between Adam. Through the sin of Adam, we all have inherited selfish natures and sin. Uh, not a sinful record. That you know, Babies are not born with a guilty record, but if they live long enough, they're going to respond selfishly and sin. But Jesus, through his act of dying and living a perfect life, he's provided righteousness for the whole world that uh, through faith we can inherit that and have a new nature, be born again, have new hearts. And so it's contrasting the obedience of Jesus to the disobedience of Adam. Through the fall of Adam, we've all suffered. Through the righteousness of Christ, we can be redeemed. And that's where Paul speaks of Jesus as being the second Adam. Right. So through the first Adam came sin. Through the second Adam, Christ comes righteousness. Right. Everlasting life. All right. Here's another question. After the new earth is created, will we be able to visit worlds that have never sinned? I think so. You know, right now we're sort of quarantined on this planet in the same way that God did not want Lucifer and the evil angels to corrupt the rest of the universe. They were finally cast down to the earth, and they're restricted here. During the millennium, Satan is bound here. We're kind of bound here right now. But once the universe is purified and God makes a new heaven and new earth, and this is not in the Bible, it's in the song Rock of Ages, it says, we will soar to worlds unknown. And it says, God through Christ made the worlds. So we're not going to be restricted. Uh, you know, we'll live and reign with Christ and we'll be ambassadors for mm -hmm. Jesus through the infinite cosmos. I, Man, you know, I look at the size of space, and you, you're never going to run out of new places to see. Right. That's for sure. The Bible says, eyes not seen, neither ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man, the things that God is preparing for those that love Him. Amen. So, yeah, you get your bag ready, get packed. You'll be traveling to <laughs> worlds afar. It'll Amen. be a blessing. All right, we got a question from Mexico. It says, who are the 144,000? All right, well, I'll... Uh, Again, I've got a little book on that you can download for free. And um, for me, the simplest way to understand the 144,000, it's 12 times 12,000. You look at the characteristics, and they are basically a last day example of the apostles. In the way that Jesus, through the apostles, they were sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he had 12 apostles. They were not the only ones saved at Pentecost. Right after they replaced Judas, they got the number to 12 again. The Holy Spirit was poured out on 120 in the upper room. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So in the last days, God's going to have 12 times 12,000 to prepare the world for the second coming. 
you look at the characteristics of the 144,000, it says they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Well, Jesus had a lot of disciples when He walked the earth, but there were only a few apostles that really followed Him wherever He went. And they were with Him in the dinners, and they'd go into the healings and the miracles, and He'd sometimes leave the multitude. He'd get in the boat with the twelve. The ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes are going to be like the last day apostles that will prepare the world for the second coming. They'll be filled with Pentecostal power and do a special work. Okay. Boy, we've got a lot of great questions coming now, in right I, now. Pastor Ross, while you're yeah. picking out the next question, we know people are joining us right now and you're wondering what is happening with this live program. First of all, text your friends. Say, go to AFTV or YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching. Tune in. We're talking about something very exciting that's coming and it's coming quick. It's going to be the Prophecy Odyssey International Evangelistic Program from New York City. That's going to be September 20 to October 5. You can participate by opening your home or church, or you can come and join us and be a missionary in the Manhattan area, Manhattan Missionary. Matter of fact, we might put that information back up on the screen. It's going to talk about the Manhattan Missionaries. We're keeping the people in the studio pretty busy. You want to join us in New York City for the Prophecy Odyssey program in the fall, beautiful city. You can go out on the street. We'll be training people, sharing literature, doing some street ministry, singing, medical work, and plan now to be there. Scan if you're interested in that. Uh, we will provide free training, free literature, a place for you to meet. You just got to pay your own travel. And we're expecting hundreds. Of, and then you can come to the meeting that night and see sites in one of the world's greatest cities at a very exciting time in history during the Prophecy Odyssey program. And we're also answering Bible questions. So uh, that's where we'll get back to. Okay, great. Well, here's the next question that we have. Um, after probation closes, will any of the saints die during the seven last plagues? You know, when the ten plagues fell on Egypt, and we learned from that, God protected the Israelites from the last seven plagues. The first three plagues, the Israelites suffered right along with the Egyptians. But during the last seven, He protected them. You read in Psalm 91, it says, Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. It says, Our bread and water will be sure. A thousand may fall at thy side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come nigh unto thee. Seems that he's protecting his people during the seven last plagues. The, the, you see, when God allows martyrs to die, it's for witnessing. You know, Paul saw Stephen die and it ultimately helped convert him. No one's going to be converted once the seven last plagues begin to fall. There's really no benefit in Christians becoming martyrs at that point. Mm -hmm. So we believe he's going to protect his people. Don't worry about the plagues, friends. Okay. Another question that we have. Uh, how do I prepare myself spiritually for the time of trouble as I prepare myself physically? Is there something we should do to get ready for the time of trouble? Well, you, they were asking about the spiritual or physical? Spiritual. spiritual. I think they, they said, I'm, I'm preparing myself physically. But what do I do spiritually? Yeah, the most important preparation is the spiritual, right. spiritual because, you know, if you're, if you're stuck, by the way, you know, we, we believe in country living and those benefits, but obviously we believe in going to cities, which is why we're going to New York City. So if you're prepared, you've got a place out in the country and plenty of food stored away, but you're not prepared spiritually, the other's all in vain. But if you're stuck in a city or in prison in the last days, but you're prepared spiritually, you're in good shape. You know, it, basically we need to be storing the promises of God in our mind. We're going to be faced with the time of Jacob's trouble. Our faith is going to be tested. And we want to know through experience that we have a relationship with Jesus. On a daily basis, you can't just start praying at the end of time and think that when the final events happen, I'm going to be ready. That's like the guy that sits in a hospital bed for six months and thinks he's going to go play basketball the day he gets out. Mm -hmm. He's not. Uh, you need to now be preparing through daily experience, relationship with the Lord, prayer, Bible study, exercising your faith, sharing your faith, and living out the Christian life. So when the test comes, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were ready for the last days because they had been practicing it. It says from his youth he had been praying three times a day. He was ready for that test because it was a way of life. Okay. Another prophecy question, who is the false prophet spoken of in Revelation? Well, in a word, I, I think that that's talking about a Protestants based in the United States. I guess it's more than a word, huh? Mm -hmm. um, 
you've got apostate Catholicism in Europe, which is principally Roman Catholicism, but you'll see the Greek, Russian, Coptic Orthodox churches will probably fall in line there. They're already sort of building alliances with the Pope. And ultimately, evangelicals in North America, uh, we're technically Protestants, but there's going to be great apostasy. And they're going to surrender the freedoms and begin to persecute again like they did back during the, the witch trials and the persecution of the Inquisition. Compelling, they're going to be a confederacy between spiritism, fallen Protestantism, Catholicism, compelling people to worship a certain way. And um, we're not far from that day. Okay, another question. Do you think Jesus could return in our lifetime? Oh, absolutely. In fact, well, you know, I've always believed that, but I believe it more all the time. Just look at what's happened to the world. Well, um, Matthew chapter 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, then the end will come. 25 years ago, we had the Net New York program, Millennium of Prophecy, and we were so excited it was going into so much of the world through these big C-band satellite dishes. Now, with the internet, the proclamation of the gospel is ubiquitous. Last week, I was in Nashville for the Religious Broadcasters Convention, climbed into an elevator, just me, and then another young lady stepped in, and she shrieked. And I thought, oh, no, what happened? And she looked at me and put her hand over her mouth. A young Middle Eastern lady, she said, oh, I can't believe I'm in an elevator with you. I'm from Iran. You don't know how many people in Iran you're touching their lives. We get Christian broadcasts through the Internet and satellite. And folks may not know that Amazing Facts translates into Farsi as well as Urdu in a number of languages. And she took a picture with me. And I would just warm my heart because we don't get many reports from Iran. So Jesus said the gospel will be preached in all the world. Then the end will come. Well, we're one of many ministries doing it. The technology all the time is increasing. The other thing is AI. Look at what's happening now with artificial intelligence where for the New York program, we're hoping we have it in place where I will preach and within an hour or two, they'll be able to convert the sermon uh, into lip sync language where it'll be in Tagalog, Russian, Hindi, Mandarin. I mean, you just think if the Lord doesn't come soon, what in the world is it, the world going to look like? So yes, can Jesus come in our lifetime? We're, we're counting on it. I'd rather not die if I don't have to. I'd rather be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. <laughs> All right, another question that we have, do I need to be baptized to go to heaven? Why a believer would not want to be baptized when the first thing Jesus said is, um, well, I should, you know, it, I should say, the gospel begins with baptism. In the Gospel of Mark, it talks about John the Baptist. The gospel ends with baptism. And Jesus said, go into all the world, teach and baptize. Christ said, whoever believes, Mark 16, and is baptized will be saved. Whoever believes not will be lost. The disciples said, repent and be baptized. So why would a believer not want to be baptized? Will there be people in heaven that were not baptized? Sure, you got a lot of Old Testament characters, people maybe who could not be baptized because of circumstances or health, thief on the cross. But every believer, baptism is a command. I don't know why they wouldn't want to. Okay, another question that we have. If somebody's attempting to do you harm or to kill you, is it okay to get angry and fight back? Well, hopefully you can fight back in a loving way. <laughs> but uh, there's nothing wrong with defending yourself. I mean, you know, if you have an argument with a friend and he slaps you on one side, don't hit him back. Jesus had turned the other cheek. You know, it's not a life-threatening situation. But Christ said when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. God expects us to use self-preservation. He said when the gates of Jerusalem are open, flee when you see the Roman armies come. God expects us to preserve our lives. If some lunatic comes up to you and tries to attack you, well, defend yourself. You know, you don't want to kill them if you don't have to. You'd want to subdue them or, or get away. But nothing wrong with self-defense. Okay, another question. Um, if I have an abortion, but I repent, will I meet my baby in heaven? Yeah, good question, sensitive question. Um, I believe so. Uh, I, I believe that, well, first of all, um, well, let me just say it this way. Obviously, it's not the unpardonable sin. 
Um, there's a lot of young ladies out there that they've just been, you know, saturated with a culture that says, oh, it's just fetal tissue you can kill your, kill your baby, terminate the pregnancy. They use this terminology. They don't understand that at conception, human life begins. The Bible says human life is sacred. Of course, God will forgive when we repent. He forgave Manasseh for murder and infanticide. So God forgives. And I think when you get to heaven, that the angels may place that child in your arms. So uh, look forward to that. The Bible says there are children in heaven. Okay. Could you please explain what happened to the people who were resurrected when Christ died? Yeah, well, they, they went to heaven. The Bible says after the resurrection of Christ, they went to heaven as a trophy. And that's that verse you quote. Yeah, it says when he, uh, he um, led, led cap captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So yeah. at the ascension of Christ. Yeah. Uh, he brought up sort of the first fruits from the grave, you might say. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Revelation chapter 4 describes a group in heaven yeah. with the Lamb. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they'll be there. All right, another question that we have. Um, what are some examples of the presumptuous sins that are referenced in Psalms 1913? Presumptuous Pre presumptuous sins. Presumptuous sin. Yeah, well, when a, when a person, uh, they look the Lord in the eye and they say, I know this is wrong, but I don't really care. I'm going to do it anyway. And especially those who continue in that behavior, that is very dangerous. Tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, I think it's verse 26, if we continue to sin willfully after we've received a knowledge of the truth. So presumptuous sin is continuing to sin willfully after you know the truth. Um, there is no sacrifice but a certain fearful looking forward to of judgment. It doesn't mean of one sin. Um, it's talking about a continuing of sin. Uh, just about everybody listening has sinned after they knew. Because sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. So mm -hmm. most people that sin know. But it's continuing and not allowing the Lord to sanctify and save you from those things. That's when it's dangerous. Okay, we've got another question that came in. Someone's asking about, they might have joined late, and asking about where are the meetings going to be held in New York? Okay, yeah, they may so, have just heard yeah, a, a piece of the in. announcement. We might put the handbill back up on the screen for our friends in the studio. Um, we are going to the Big Apple, as they say. Uh, I, I grew up in New York City. My, I was born in California, but I moved to New York City. We're going to be doing the Prophecy Odyssey program. There it is. And... Um, it's going to be uh, right downtown on, in the Manhattan Center in New York City on 34th Street. It's right across the street from Madison Square Garden and Kitty Corner from Penn Station, one of the most beautiful, famous subway stations in the world. And, um, and if you like cameras, it's across from B&H Camera, too. <laughs> but, uh, and it's going to be during a beautiful time of year, very much like the Net New York program. Now, now they use the expression, does lightning strike twice? The New York program was really something. It was on the edge of the millennium changing. There was an election. The New York Giants were playing. I'm sorry, the New York Mets were playing the Giants in the World Series. Am I getting that right? Yeah. And it was just a really exciting yeah, time. Hillary Clinton was running for Senate. She was running Senate for Senate at that, time, yeah. at that time. And just to be in the city, the, the electricity and the energy, people, Y2K, they thought the yeah. world was ending. Well, friends, we're at that point now again. You've got war in Ukraine, war in the Middle East. Um, do you know there are more Jews in New York City? I think the second highest population of Jews in the world is New York City, first being Israel. New York City, then maybe Miami and Miami Beach, Florida. A and so um, it's going to be a lot of energy, a lot of interest. It's in the news every day. So many news broadcasts globally come from New York City. So you'll want to be there for this event. Uh, the World Church is going to be broadcasting the message to the world. And you can be part of that. Okay, very good. Uh, we're going to just remind our friends, if you just joined us, we are taking your Bible questions. So maybe our studio, they just got through with one graphic. You can put up that QR code. If you have a question, just is. scan that QR code and you'll see where you can type your question and be getting them live. Pastor Doug, another question. Why did Jesus, after he came out of the tomb, say, do not touch me? Yeah, actually, the word in the original Hebrew, if you look at King James, it says, do not touch me. Uh, you'll notice in some other translations, it says, do not cling to me. And Christ explains to Mary Magdalene, he said, do not, she was going to grab him by the feet and hang on to him. 
And he said, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. In other words, I've got to go somewhere. He wasn't saying, you're dirty, don't touch me. The word is actually, don't hold me. Don't hold me back, because I still... He had not even ascended to the Father. The only person he appeared to before his ascension was Mary. Mm -hmm. And that's the one where, remember, Simon said, don't let her touch you, for she is a sinner. At least he thought that in his heart. So no, Jesus did not say, Mary, don't touch me. He said, don't hold me, don't detain me because I still need to tell, ascend to my Father and have my sacrifice declared, uh, approved. And he told Mary, you go and tell my brethren that I'm alive. And he gave her that first message. Okay, another question. When do we need to flee from the cities? Yeah, well, it's actually something that we should learn in stages. I, I think it's, uh, it's not advisable for families with children to be living in uh, you know, uh, deep urban areas with young children, they're much better off if they can be in a more rural environment where they can see some things of nature. That doesn't mean you need to be way out in the woods of Alaska, but even in the suburbs where you have a little bit of yard is preferable. Um, and you know the risks, whenever we see that there's been a lot of rioting or violence, if there's a shortage of supplies, the first place that you see bedlam and chaos is the the downtown centers in the cities. Uh, things get out of control. You usually don't hear about the riot in Covalo, California. Mm -hmm. So the smaller towns are usually better. So that it's a good idea now not to be stationed there. We read in Inspiration that as we near the end of time, uh, there's going to be some religious persecution. And there'll be even laws that tell us, you know, that we need to worship on a certain day. That would be the time for us to be getting out and living in more remote places where you can grow your own food preparatory to the day where we may have to flee for our lives into remote places where God will guide us at that point. But um, it's not a bad idea if you can afford it. If some people are working from home. If you can grow some of your own food and kids raise them up in a more uh, you know, natural environment, it's always much better for kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another question. How did the earth get repopulated after the flood? In other words, how do people travel and arrive at different continents? Yeah, well, you know, we're finding out that um, uh, things happen much quicker than you might hear from some of the scientists. They, they know that there was a land bridge and that ocean levels were much lower uh, after the flood. There was like an ice age. It all happened very quickly, though. And people began to populate pretty quickly. And you do the math, and even by the time of Noah, there could have been a billion people in the world when folks live hundreds of years, and they have big families. Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. So uh, they went across probably land bridges, populated the Americas. They can track the DNA. Uh, I've seen some very interesting DNA maps that they're tracking now where they say that uh, the world was populated either from uh, North Central Africa or the Middle East, Mesopotamia. Well, the Bible says it was Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. And um, they just fanned out up into Asia, over the Bering Strait, down into the Americas. They took some boats to the Polynesian Islands and off into Australia. And you can track the history of man pretty well now with DNA studies. I think with part of the DNA studies that they did, they, they finally concluded that all, all human life came from a single mother and father. That's right. Very interesting. They have studied the my, uh, mitochondrial DNA, the mother's DNA, All and they the say everybody down. came from one woman and everybody came from one man. That was just released. Even National Geographic yeah. said that not too long ago. You know, just to say, on the subject of creation, evolution, um, I know we, we haven't released this yet, but we're excited about it. We're going to tell you about it. Amazing Facts is working on a sharing magazine yeah. all about creation and evidences for creation and questions that you know come up if you if you look at evolution so that's coming i know yeah. it's well in the works but stay tuned for more information about that a great sharing resource okay another question <laughs> this is an interesting one why does luke chapter 16 seem to talk about people going to heaven or hell right away after they die can you explain that yeah there there's only one place they're talking about there and that's in the parable of the rich man and lazarus it starts i think at verse 19 and uh, it's, this is an allegory. Jesus is talking to a crowd where there are some scribes and Pharisees. You go back and look and you can see this. He's telling parables earlier in the chapter. And he's talking about, you know, the Jewish people shouldn't be thinking that because we have the truth, we're the only ones saved. So he shares this parable about a poor man, a beggar, covered with sores. The only comfort he gets is the dogs. That was an analogy, a term for the Gentiles. 
and a rich man clothed in purple. This is the Jewish nation. They've got the truth. They're feasting on the word. They both die. The rich man, he goes to Hades, which is the pagan place of torment in Greek mythology. The poor man, who represents the Gentiles, he goes to Abraham's bosom, the Jewish place of reward. So Christ says they're going to opposite places. This isn't a parable. People in heaven and hell, says Abraham's talking to the person, uh, the rich man, they're not going to talk to each other. It says a drop of water will cool his tongue. The drop of water is not going to cool anyone's tongue. And the, the real moral of the story is the last verse where Abraham says to the man, the rich man, he says, look, if rich man says, if someone was resurrected, then they believe. Send so someone to tell them. Send Lazarus back to warn my father's house. And Abraham says, if they do not believe Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded that one should rise from the dead. Jesus raises someone from the dead by the name of Lazarus, mm. and the religious leaders, most of them, did not believe. Mm. So it's an allegory. It's not saying that people in heaven and hell right away. Okay, we've been talking a little bit about a time of trouble or tribulation. And so Vincent is asking, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, talks about 10 days of tribulation. But be faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. What is this talking about, 10 days of tribulation? I'm not going to steal your thunder. You know that prophecy. <laughs> it's it's uh, the Church of Smyrna. I did get excited when I saw that verse, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> so that's talking about 10 years. One prophetic day equals one literal year. Yeah. That's from 303 to 313. It's the persecution under Diocletian. And it was 10 years of severe persecution, mm -hmm. followed by Constantine, who finally legalized Christianity in 313. So... Uh, that church referred to there was a church suffering severe persecution. Mm -hmm. The church of Smyrna was a time of suffering. Yep. And that's what's been referred to. Okay, very good. Um, what do you think about Matthew 13, 30 and church discipline? Do you think it's right for churches to disfellowship someone? Matthew 13, verse Well, 30. it's also in Matthew 18. So we'll go to Matthew 13. And um, I've got my handy-dandy iPad here. I usually use a different program, but this is nice and small. Um, 13, verse 30. 13, 30. Is we're the friends. Yes. Let both grow together until the harvest. Oh, I see. They're talking about the parable of the wheat and tares, and they're wondering, well, maybe it's not right to disfellowship people. No, I don't think that, because you read in Matthew 18, Jesus makes it pretty clear that the church does have authority to put a person out. Uh, Paul talks about that in the first letter of Corinthians about a man who was sleeping with his stepmother, said, put him out, deliver him unto Satan. Um, and uh, yeah, the church needs to have standards. And the reason it tells us people were added to the church in Pentecost is because people could also be subtracted if they didn't live up, if they forsook their faith. And so Jesus said, treat them like a heathen or a publican. So they're like they're a lost person. If they do not respect the authority of the church or if they turn away. So that's not saying you should never disfellowship people. It just means that there are people in the church and we can't tell if they're wheat or tares. Mm -hmm. So you got to be very careful if you can't tell. But when a person is obviously you know, denied the faith and then they're not living it, you need to enact church discipline. Okay, another question related to end time. Justin is asking, can you describe what it means? I hear about the shaking time and the latter rain. What, what will that look like? Yeah, well, you know, before Christ comes, everybody is going to either have the seal of God or the mark of the beast. There are good people and bad people kind of mixed up everywhere. We've got a lot of great, wonderful people in our church, and we've got some that are not very faithful. We've got some that are just the Judas. They're devils in sheep's clothing. And there are people in the world that they, they're looking for the Lord. They're sincere. Jesus said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. There's people all kind of mixed up. But everybody is going to be polarized into one of two groups before Jesus comes. There'll be a shaking, a sifting that will separate the wheat from the chaff. Talking about parables. And uh, I think there's going to be a shaking theologically. There's going to be a shaking socially. There's going to be a shaking with natural disasters, financial problems. The whole world is going to be shaken with religious persecution where everybody is going to be compelled to take a stand on one side or the other. And um, some will be shaken out, some will be shaken in. And I, we want to make sure we're rooted in the truth. Jesus says there's a storm that comes to the wise man and there's a storm that mm -hmm. comes to the fool. There's going to be a storm. And you want to be building on the rock right now. Okay, very good. 
Um, another question that we have. It just moved on me up past the day, and it was a pretty good one. Let me see. Well, while you're finding that, uh, yes. there's new people joining us all the time. Uh, now a word from your sponsor. One of the main reasons we're also doing this program is to announce to people that Amazing Facts 3ABN is going to be broadcasting globally the Prophecy Odyssey Evangelistic Program from New York City. Everybody that gets either 3ABN or Amazing Facts or you have an internet connection, it'll be on Hope Channel International, can participate in this premier evangelistic program that's coming September 20 to October 5 this year, 25th anniversary of the Millennium of Prophecy. You can open your home, your church, go to Prophecy Odyssey. They'll put that website up there for you. If you want to look at the website, it's continuing to grow and expand. ProphecyOdyssey.com to find more information. New set of 15 lessons on prophecy that are going to be available for everybody to participate. And uh, springing from downtown New York City, the Manhattan Center, same location as the Millennium of Prophecy. And we're inviting people to come. If you want to be part of it, you can come during the event. We'll give you a training and literature in the morning. You can go share and invite people in the afternoon, get some dinner, see some sites, then bring them to the meeting. And you'd be a Manhattan missionary. There it is. Scan that QR code there up on your screen. All right. You got that question now? You know, there's so many. Another one just popped up. <laughs> Let me ask you <laughs> They're this They're pushing one. the other ones out of the I way. No, huh? they, they keep moving on me here. But here's one that people often ask. All right, you ready for a pastor? Now? Will my pet be in heaven? Well, it depends on if it's a dog or a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I heard dogs go to heaven. I <laughs> know <laughs> cats are kind of evil. No, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, you know, my good friend Steve Wilberg actually wrote a book on that. He, he delves into those dangerous waters. Mm -hmm. I think his final conclusion is that God's going to surprise us and we're going to see some of our pets in heaven. We know there's animals there, and, um, but you won't find a scripture anywhere that says, and I will save thy pet. I sure hope so. I've had some great pets. Okay. They've all been dogs. No one will be disappointed. In, yeah, they were all dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I had pet mice as a kid. But. <laughs> all right. Do angels have the ability to have physical bodies or appear? With physical bodies like like people well i think so mm -hmm. uh it talks about angels that you know appeared to abraham that they went into uh, and they ate with abraham and they went into sodom and gomorrah and rescued a lot and his family it says they took them by their hands so they felt the angels so angels are real they're around us uh, we're restricted to our dimensions angels can live in that fourth dimension where they can materialize and be very real and do physical things to protect people as well. So it tells us about prophets that were fed by angels. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, another question that we have. Uh, scientists are saying that the moon is rusting. People are saying that this has something to do with Bible prophecy as the moon turning to blood. Have you heard anything about that? Well, I, I know it talks about the moon turning to blood, but uh, and typically when we say the moon turning to blood, that was a sign of war. If you've ever seen a forest fire, fire mm -hmm. and when the moon comes up at night and there's so much smoke in the air, it's blood red. So that usually meant there was war and fighting when the skies were filled with smoke and they were burning villages. Um, it doesn't mean the moon itself is turning red. It's going to appear red because of the catastrophes on the earth. So uh, I don't know about the rust on the moon, sorry. Okay. Pastor Doug, important question. Will Pastor Doug do a backhand spring again? Come and see is what <laughs> Jesus said. You need to come and see. Right. Whenever I do the health talk, I try and illustrate something, but well, I don't know what I, I haven't done one in years. You're going to have to I'm working on it. We played right? racquetball today. We did. <laughs> I was running still, so we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, do women need to cover their heads and be silent in church? Yeah, in 1 Corinthians uh, 11, there's some interesting verses there that talk about a woman praying with her head covered. And then later in the chapter, Paul says, but we have no such custom. We think that most, there's no command anywhere that women cover their heads. Uh, some churches believe they should because of that verse. Uh, it, it does seem plain on its first super, superficial reading, but as you read ar around it, it seems like it's specifically talking about um, the culture of the day. Women, if they had their heads uncovered, 
in, in a religious place, it was considered a lack of submission to their husbands or disrespectful to the house of God. You always see Mary in the Catholic picture. She always ever has her head covered, uh, almost always. Um, I, I think it's, well, that was more of a, a custom. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've traveled to India, and yeah. their customs are different there yeah. than here. And if you go to church, uh, you'll see all of the shoes of those who are coming to worship outside of the uh, front of the church. It's a yeah. sign of reverence to take your shoes off. You're going to a place of worship. Yeah. And of course here in Western culture for a man to enter into a church and keep his hat on, that's a sign of disrespect. But in some places, men, for example, at the Western Wailing Wall, wall you, you put you your hat on. cover your head if you're a man. So yeah. different. Uh, the, the point there being respect. show respect. Yeah. yeah. Recognize and the And it culture was a sign of respect and, and humility. So uh, now we've got two minutes left, Pastor Ross. Maybe another question or two, and then we're going to kind of wrap it up and tell people about the exciting event that's coming. You'll be hearing more. All right. Let me find a good question to, to see if we could, we could wrap up here. Um, will there be prophets in the last days? Joel chapter 2, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will see visions and prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. So, yeah, prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14 is one of the gifts of the Spirit. It's also in uh, chapter 12. And so, um, yeah, God has never revoked or withdrawn that gift of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, you may see, the Bible says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So you may see more prophets performing signs and wonders and miracles like Moses and Elijah just before the second coming. Okay. Well, we've got a minute and a half, Pastor Doug. Recap the exciting events coming October. All right. If September, you haven't October. heard yet, people are joining along the way. We're seeing that from the questions coming in, the attendance is swelling right now. This will be archived on Facebook so you can tell your friends they can watch the program. But uh, Amazing Facts is going to be partnering with Three Angels Broadcasting, and I'll be at 3ABN to also announce it in uh, coming months. A special program, evangelistic program, going to the globe from New York City to the world called Prophecy Odyssey. And you can go to the Prophecy Odyssey website to learn more about the event. We're going to be printing new lessons, 15 presentations, 2,000-seat auditorium, right downtown New York City. We're going to have great music, Bible questions. You can be part of it by in opening your church, opening your home, inviting your friends in, uh, and watching either on 3ABN, Amazing Facts TV, Hope International, and participate in this broadcast. Um, come to the city, be a Manhattan missionary. We'd love to have you be part of it. Go out on the streets, invite your friends, give out handbills, free literature we're going to be sharing with people. You want to know about that? There it is on the screen. And most of all, Karen keeps reminding me, pray. Mm. Except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain. Please start praying now. God will pour out His Spirit and reach many souls in this event.